elements. One of the things it takes for Christian to grow is to be rooted people in God's Word. It takes living water, the Holy Spirit pouring out into us and through us. It takes, you know, for plants, it takes nitrogen, it takes different kinds of fertilizer, it takes water, it takes the right kind of soil, right temperatures, different plants, everything a little bit different mix. And it's the same way with Christians. It takes a little bit more of this, a little bit less of that for us to develop and grow well. And only God knows the right formula, right? But we trust in Him. So, with all that said, Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, talks something about this to me. And I hope it speaks to you as well. It says, Blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. In other words, they, the Christians should separate them things from the worldly ways, right? Or from the ungodly. But his delight is in the law, or in the word of the Lord, and on it he meditates day and night on God's word. We, we think about it, we ponder it. We ask ourselves, how does this and other scripture go together to form the right ideas in our minds and the right thoughts? And it says, he is like a tree planted by streams of water, that's the living water part, which yield its fruit in season and whose leaves do not wither. Whatever he does prospers. I want you to think about that. Are you being watered by the Spirit? Do you have the things that you need to grow well? Are you withering or are you flourishing as a Christian? Are you applying the things of God to your lives? Are you growing well? Are you producing fruit? Are all the necessary elements there for us to be what God has called us to be? Because when we are, this psalm talks about we are not made for ordinary lives. We're made for extraordinary lives. Don't you believe that God has something special for you? And he has called you. You're not just to be an average, run-of-the-mill person. But you are called to do higher, better things, to share the gospel and hope of Jesus Christ. You're called to change the world through what you do. And I think it, again, I think it all begins right here in our hearts, right here in our minds. What we do, what we say, what we apply ourselves to. We want so much more of you, God. We want to thrive. We want to grow well for you. We want to be vigorous with our sharing testimonies with others. As well. Let's all stand. Let's go back to worship. Let's try this song. Let's really think about what these words mean to us. Thank you. <laughs> you go ahead.
like fast and go. We must stay connected to the body. Or even that life. He is the source of our lives. By looking to him in every situation, he will deliver us. He will. He is faithful.
devil under our feet. Yeah. And so he wrote this, and he says these words because apparently the church in Ephesus was not experiencing the overcoming abundant life. And as I look around in our world, there are far, 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 far too many Christians who are not experiencing the overcoming abundant life that Jesus Christ came and lived and died and rose again for us to have. <laughs> and that is our goal, that we would all understand that and we would all grab a hold of that, we would all know the truth of that, so that we can be powerful for him and allow his kingdom to come. Amen? Amen. So last week we talked about verses um, in chapter 6 of Ephesians, beginning of verse 10. Because after all that, as I said, Paul says, finally, <laughs> finally, an important word, like, this is the thing after everything else that I've said, this is the most important, this is the thing that I want you to really, I want you to really pay attention and get. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong. We talked about that has to do with supernatural strength just being poured into us. That we receive where we get it only from the Lord. It's only found in one place. Strong in the Lord and his mighty power. We're talking about that power is demonstrated power. It's like he rose Christ from the dead. That's a demonstration. That's an awesome demonstration, amen? amen. <laughs> but when we gather, we need to see the power of God at work for encouragement and for the unbelievers to believe and all kinds of reasons and for us to be just sure that God's in our midst because surely he is. Amen. Put on the full armor of God. We talked about don't forget this half dress. <laughs> so that when, that so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And we talked about the confusion and the lies and the false perceptions and the playground that the devil just loves to make with our minds. We talked about burning up our lines from First Peter and what that has to do with those loose ends of our thinking, those things that still, you know, toilet out here, those dangling thoughts of, of disbelief, those dangling thoughts of shoulda, coulda, wouldas, those negative thoughts of guilt and shame, all those things that Christ paid for, all those things we need to gather up and stick them in our girdle and be done with them so that we can run the race with endurance. Amen? For our struggle, or we wrestle not, we talked about being an intense struggle, fierce combat. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We talked about how Satan evidently has these rank and powers of things that he can just unleash. But therefore, put on the full armor of God. It tells us that again. So that when the day of evil comes, and we talked about you know, receive some evil days, amen, you may be able to stand, taking a firm, hard position. Stand your ground after you've done everything to stand. And we get it with, that means standing at your post. And we talked about the great Greek word, hupomino, meaning taking a, a stand and not allowing the enemy to take back what has been won. Amen? Amen. Right. So, that wore me out just for being a so Monday night when we gather, we're gathering every Monday night for prayer, believing that we're supposed to do that until the night right before the election. And last Monday night as we gathered here in this place, it just we had a little, we had a sign up here, and we had some music playing, and the sign had like this knight on his horse, ready for battle, and it said, taking territory. And we just firmly believed that we were gaining and taking territory, and we had two specific things in mind. Children. Because in our world, children are being killed, being stolen, being enslaved, being abused, and that's not okay. So we took some ground, took some territory for children and also for churches. The churches would rise up in the power that God has given them for such a time as this. And we firmly believe that we took some territory and we firmly believe that we are standing there for and not allowing the enemy to take back what's been gained. So here we are, ready to dig into each piece of this armor. And now remember, Paul, he's in prison. And the only view really that he has, the only thing that he is really specifically focused in on, are the Roman soldier prison guards. And so he's looking at this armor. I mean, they had everything covered, everything covered um, defensively, offensively. Every piece for a specific purpose. And then he's watching this, 
And as he's looking at these Roman guards, and then as he's taking in each piece of armor, the Holy Spirit apparently is just pouring into Paul. Everything that we have been given spiritually is just as important as those Roman guards have been given physically. Everything that he has given us is for a purpose. And we're going to learn what those are tonight. And hopefully we're going to be stronger when we leave. So verse 14, thank you so much for paying attention. Amen. Stand firm then. This is the fourth time he said this word, stand. Apparently that's important. Standing firm on the foundation. Amen. Amen. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. The belt of truth. Now think about that. Okay, the Roman soldier, he had this thing that's called a loin belt. And the purpose of the loin belt was basically to hold everything together and everything in place. Everything together and everything in place. Firm and secure. I mean, the loin belt, it had everything that the Roman soldier would need to go out on the battlefield. It had a place where he could clip his shield. It had a place where he could clip his bow. It had places in the back where he could clip his arrows so that they would be readily available to his reach. It had a place on the front where he would purposely Secure the, the breastplate that he wore. We'll get to that in a minute. So that it wasn't just flopping around and getting in his way and allowing the enemy to come in, you know. <clears throat> so this loin belt, this belt, Paul tells us to put on and stand firm with the belt of truth. Buckle around your waist. And can I just suggest the only place where we're going to find true truth is in the Word of God. Amen. <laughs> The only person we're going to find truth in is the one who said, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. And so with that in mind, can I just say, before we leave the house every day, we need to wrap ourselves up in the comfort of knowing that Jesus Christ is covering everything for us. That he, we are wrapped in the security of knowing that he is the center of everything that we are. He holds everything together. He, oh my gosh, the scripture that said that I just thought of it. It's in Colossians. Hallelujah. Oh yeah. 117, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Amen. So could Jesus just be the center of our lives? And can we just wrap ourselves around the truth that he is the one and only way to heaven? That he is the one and only King of kings and Lord of lords? That he is the one and only purpose for what we've been saying here for? The belt of truth. Buckle around your waist. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. Now, I kind of always just skimmed over that, and I said, well, the breastplate of righteousness is to guard our hearts, and that's very true. The Roman soldier had this breastplate, and it would guard his heart and his, you know, important organs, so that the enemy couldn't thrust and injure or kill him. But as I read this this week, and as I was thinking about the breastplate of righteousness, what in the world, and God has something special yeah, probably just for me, probably not for anybody else. <laughs> I love the word of God. Because as I was reading that, God took me to Romans 3.10 that says, There is no one righteous, not even one. Well, that's good news. <laughs> there is no one righteous, not even one. The Paul here, he's talking about the law. But then all of a sudden, he turns it. And in verse 21, but now apart from the law, being redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have been set free from the law, now we're operated by grace. Amen? Amen? But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. Amen. Verse 22 says, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ Amen. to all who believe. So this righteousness it is only available through Jesus Christ and his blood. Amen. Right. But it is the gift of God. 
It's given through faith. Just like every other gift of the Spirit, just like our salvation, just like everything else we receive from God, we receive it by grace and faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen? This righteousness, so he gives us righteousness. But, so I went back to 117, and it says, For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteousness will live by faith. Will live by faith. The righteousness of Christ. So the righteousness of God is revealed. And the righteousness of God causes him, listen, to always act in accordance to his inner nature, in accordance to his holiness, in accordance to his love, and in accordance to his truth. So, if the righteous who receive the righteousness of Christ through our faith in Jesus Christ our Lord, if the righteousness, the righteous live by faith, this is where it gets kind of ouchy. It should cause, the righteousness of Christ should cause us to always act in accordance with his inner nature. With God's inner nature, with His holiness, with His love, and with His truth. I mean, we are ambassadors of Christ. We are we are representing Him here on earth. We are who people see the righteousness of Christ in, and the righteousness of Christ acts in accordance to his inner nature, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Amen. And his holiness, a cut above, really kind of what that word means, in accordance to his love, and in accordance to his truth, his word. That's how we know that we're living the righteousness of Christ. Amen? Uh, I'll never forget um, several years ago when I was on the National Cabinet or Council, whatever they call it, the Force Square. And I was out in the meeting in California, and Glenn Burris, who was the president at the time, he was talking about Jack Hafer, the previous president. And he was talking about how at 4 30 a.m. one morning, he received a call from Pastor Jack. And I mean, Pastor Jack was just Frank, you've got to get over here right now. We've got to go to prayer right now. And so, of course, Lynn just jumped out of bed thinking, oh my goodness, something terrible has happened. And so he jumps in his car and he drives over and he gets to Pastor Jack's house. And Pastor Jack is there. I mean, he is just, he is just upset and he is just weeping and he is just pacing back and forth. And, you know, when Lynn got there, he said, I'm so glad you're here. And he began to just tell Lynn what was going on. <laughs> And Glenn said, I was, I was just continuously like, and, 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 and it was something so trivial. <coughs> it was something like very minute as far as what we would consider would be sin. And, you know, I can't even remember exactly what it was. I think Pastor Jack had said something to another pastor, and he thought that other pastor might think something negative about Glenn. But Glenn said it, it was so remarkable in that moment. We had to have confession. We had to have communion. We had to have repentance. Pastor Jack did. And this is what I remember him saying. Jack Hayford didn't want anything, big or small, to stand between him and Jesus. Well, there's a challenge. <laughs> He didn't want anything big or small to stand between him and Jesus. He understood what the righteousness of Christ was like and wanted to represent him that way. Amen? Amen. So you see, we, so when we're walking and suited up with the breastplate of righteousness, it made me think of David. You know, he wasn't a perfect man. He made all kinds of sinful mistakes. And yet, 
we hear him say these things like, Create me a clean oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O oh Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and it hit me. That's the problem. Too many of us have let the shield, I mean, the, the breastplate of righteousness <laughs> fall or get out of place. And the enemy has come in and has struck us, and our hearts have become hardened and callous and broken and bruised. <laughs> and we need to allow the healing balm of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> To touch our hearts and to renew us and to restore to us the joy of our salvation. I mean, do you remember when you first got saved? Do you remember why you were so excited? Do you remember why you had so much joy? Because at that moment, you felt like every sin in your past was gone. You felt like every shame was gone. You felt like every guilt thing was gone. And you had this joy. It was like nothing you could even imagine or talk about. It was this joy. But you know, then life kind of drudges on. And things happen. And we get worn out. And we need to remember and get back to that place of, oh God, created me a clean heart. Because negativity can come in. And <laughs> guilt can come in. And shame can sneak its way in. in it's ugly little path. So let's keep our breastplates of righteousness firm and secure in Christ Jesus. Amen. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Your feet, now you have to understand the Roman soldiers' feet. What they had, I mean, up to their legs, up to their knees, was this really strong leather or metal. And those are called greaves. <coughs> greaves. Now the purpose of the greaves were to protect the legs, to protect the calves, because they would have to walk through thorny, thick brush and you know stuff like that that would cause injury to the legs. But also, that's one place where their enemy would try to strike them in the shin to break their leg so they couldn't fight. So their greaves, they would protect their legs from that. And then they had these shoes that were tightly, I mean tight. I'm talking tight. So their feet couldn't slip or move anywhere. And then on the bottom of these shoes, they had all these spikes that for one purpose would allow them to hold their ground <laughs> and not be moved when the enemy tried to push them around, but also protruding out of the front of these shoes were two really long spikes that they could use for weapons. I mean, you didn't want to fall down and have them step on you. So isn't it strange that as Paul is looking at these vicious weapons on the Roman's feet, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, your shoes fitted with the gospel of peace. I didn't know how to explain that, so I went to my Greek word book. And it says this, just as the greaves of a Roman soldier protected him from the environment and from the blows of his enemy, the peace of God when it is operating in your life, protects and defends you from the hassles and assaults of the devil. The enemy may try to disrupt you, distract you, and steal your attention by causing negative events to whirl all around you, but his attempts will fail because the peace of God, like a protective greed, stops you from being hurt and enables you to keep marching forward. Just as those spikes held a Roman soldier securely in place, when his enemy tried to push him around, the peace of God will hold you in place, when the devil tries to push you around. And as the soldier uses those spikes to kick and to kill his opponent, there is no need for you to ever stop moving ahead just because the devil tries to block your path. If he is foolish enough to try to get in front of you, just keep walking. Stop all the way. By the time you're finished using your shoes in peace, you won't have much of a devil problem to deal with anymore. Paul uses this illustration to tell us that we must firmly tie God's peace into our lives. 
If we only give peace a loosely fitting position in our lives, it won't be long before the affairs of life knock our peace out of place. Hence, we must bind peace onto our minds and emotions in the same way Roman soldiers make sure to bind their shoes very tightly onto their feet. When peace is in place in your life, it gives you the assurance you need to step out in faith and makes the moves God is leading you to make. But before you take those steps, you need to be sure his peace is operating in your life. This mighty and powerful peace of your spiritual weaponry is essential because without it, the devil can try to kick, punch, pull, and distract you. But with that conquering peace firmly tied to your mind and emotions, you'll be empowered to keep marching ahead, impervious to the devil's attempts to take you down. So put on your shoes firmly tied with the peace of God. Peace beyond all understanding. Fitted with the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up. Here we go back to doing something. We gotta take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now this is you know we see the pictures of the little round shields. Um yeah, shields. But really in the Greek, the word that he uses for shield has to do with basically a door. So we're talking this big rectangular shield so basically the Roman soldier could hide behind the shield. Take up the shield of faith so that you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now these shields, these, these shields that the Roman soldiers used, they were, like I said, as big as a door. They were covered with six layers of animal hide or, you know, leather. Six layers, they were strong. But here's how they had to take care of it. Every morning when they got up, they had to put oil on a cloth. And they had to rub the shield all over so that it was covered in oil. Number one, to protect the shield from getting dried and cracked and broken. And number two, so that when the flaming arrows hit that, it was slippery, and the arrows would slide right off. Now, so if we are taking, if we're taking the shield of faith, and we're holding it in front of us and above us, as the enemy is firing those darts that say you're not good enough, you say, what do you say? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Yeah. Yeah, the enemy is firing darts, but you can't do that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens yeah. me. Yeah. When the enemy says, you're too weak for that, you can raise up your shield of faith, and you can say, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. So as these fiery darts are coming, we have a shield that we can fight back, we can defend ourselves, because our shield of faith means that every day we are being anointed with the oil of the Holy Spirit, not just a one-time thing, because if we're not being re-oiled and refueled, then we get dry and damaged and broken. So we have got to keep our shield oil so that we can fight out those fiery darts. And another thing, <laughs> while I'm at it, it wasn't just for person and person and person, it was for unity. Because as the, as the soldiers gathered together, they would raise those shields over as big as the door, and they would hold them together, and they would have this formation, and the name sounds like turtle, I can't remember what it's called. But they would hold each other's shields arm to arm and cover each other. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's make sure that our brothers and sisters are covered as well. The shield of faith. Take the helmet of salvation. It's the last place I'm going here tonight. <laughs> Take the helmet of salvation. And this is kind of like the breastplate, you know. I guard the heart, and I used to say, well, this guards your mind. But so much deeper than that. 
so much deeper than that. The helmet of salvation. Now, first you have to understand, as we're comparing to the Roman soldiers, <laughs> these, these helmets were flamboyant. I mean, I learned they had all kinds of artistic, beautiful drawings on them, like etches. I mean, a beautiful piece that they would wear on their heads. I mean, there were specific things that would um, protect the cheeks and the jaws, of course. And I learned that they would <laughs> they would have this this hair, horse hair, or <coughs> different colors that would stand straight. And if they were in a parade or something, that hair might go all the way down their back. In other words, their helmet got noticed. Their helmet got noticed. So I want you to think about that for a minute. <coughs> Can I just say our helmet of salvation should get us noticed? Yeah, exactly. Not us noticed, but Christ in us noticed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why would the Holy Spirit compare a piece of weaponry like this to salvation? Because your salvation is the most gorgeous, intricate, elaborate, and most ornate gift that God has ever given you. Paul calls his marvelous gift the helmet of salvation. He likened salvation to these flamboyant helmets that were worn on the head where everyone would notice. By using this example, Paul was telling us something very important. When a person is confident of his salvation, and when he walks confidently in the powerful reality of all that salvation means for him, he is a noticeable individual. But why did a Roman soldier need a helmet that was so tightly wrapped around his head as the Greek word implies? This kind of helmet was essential because the Roman soldier opponent carried a short handled axe called a battle axe. And when battle axes were used, heads roll. If the Roman soldier didn't have a helmet on when he went out to fight, he could be absolutely sure that he would lose his head. Thus, the Roman helmet had, was not merely a beautiful piece of weaponry, but a defensive weapon designed to stay on man's head. That's exactly what salvation will do for you when you wear it like a helmet on your head. But if you don't walk in all that your salvation entails, you may feel the brunt of the enemy's battle axe as he comes to attack your mind and steal your victory. Listen to this. If your salvation is not worn tightly around your mind like a helmet, the enemy will come to chop the multiple blessings of your salvation right out of your theology. He will try to hack away at your foundation, telling you that healing, deliverance, preservation, and soundness of mind were not really a part of Jesus' redemptive work on the cross. And by the time the enemy is finished with your mind, the only blessing he will leave you with is heaven. I told Earl a couple of weeks ago, isn't it sad? You know, people just get saved, and then hallelujah, I'm going to heaven. And they forget that there is life in between here and there. And they forget that Jesus really died so that we could have. And the sacrifice that he paid so that we could have abundant life. And I mean, if all there was was salvation just to get to heaven, then as soon as we say, yes, Jesus, I believe in you, come into my life. Then I mean, boom, you take us out and we'd be in heaven. If that's all there was. But there is so much more. And when right. people tell me they think being a Christian is boring, I say, well, then come and spend a little time at my house. <laughs> because it is an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Because I'm telling you, this is not in this, but I'm telling you that healing and deliverance and preservation and soundness of mind are really a part of what Jesus died for us to have. Right. <laughs> Many believers try to do the work of God without making it a personal goal to walk in the full knowledge of their salvation. And they are spiritually slaughtered as a result. By exposing their unprotected minds to the devil's insinuations, they place themselves in a position to be severely attacked or possibly deceived. Facing the adversary with your helmet of salvation is foolish. You have to have this helmet on if you're going to be useful and successful in the kingdom of God. You see, the devil knows 
that if he can seize your mind and fill with lies, he can then begin to operate from this lofty position in your life. He can try to manipulate your emotions, send signals of sickness and disease into your body, and so on. To protect you from such attacks is the very reason God has given you the helmet of salvation. The fact that Paul likens our salvation to a helmet means that we must know all that our salvation includes inside and out. We must spend time studying what the Bible has to say about healing, about our deliverance from evil powers, about God's desire to bless and prosper us, and about the benefits of our redemption in our everyday lives. Our intellectual comprehension of all that salvation encompasses must be ingrained in our minds, and when our minds are convinced of these realities, in other words, when our minds are trained and taught to think correctly in terms of our salvation, that solid knowledge becomes the helmet in our lives. And at that point, it doesn't matter how hard the devil tries to hack away at our spiritual foundation, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt what Jesus' death and resurrection purchased for us. This knowledge has become a part of us, preventing the enemy from attacking our minds as he did in the past. That's how the full knowledge of our salvation puts a helmet on our heads. So we have the breastplate. I'm sorry, we have the truth. The belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness. Our feet fitted with the gospel of peace. Our shield of faith. Our helmet of salvation. And the sword of the spirit. Which is the word of God. Amen. And it's interesting here, the word, that word, the, the word that Paul used for word, it's not logos, the written word of God. He used rhema, spoken word of God. Specific, quickened word. <laughs> And as he's looking at the sword of the Roman soldiers, I mean, they practiced, they practiced combat like no other army practices combat. And they learned specifically with these swords to do like this thrust, two inches. I mean, they knew the exact organ, the exact place, the exact point to kill somebody. I mean, they were vicious. <laughs> they were evil. And when Paul tells us to take the sword of the Spirit from the Holy Spirit, which is the Word of God, the spoken specific Word of God, when you are in combat, when you are in prayer, and all of a sudden that quickened Word, I mean, this is the Word of God. This is truth. This is what we live by. This is what we know. This is what we line up our lives with. Yes, this written Word of God, love us, perfect and powerful. But when you are in a time of battle, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit drops a word, a quickened word, a quickened scripture into your heart and into your mind, you can know that if you speak that out loud, it is going to be a fatal blow to the enemy. Yeah. <laughs> so we got to be in tune. We have to listen. Hallelujah. And when we hear, we have to act. And we speak the word of God boldly and powerful. And that specific word will be the powerful, deadly blows, the enemy at that time. Hallelujah. So, I think we have, oh yeah. <laughs> You've been looking at that. <laughs> So before you leave the house every morning, this is what I want you to look like. <laughs> I, I hope it's your color. <laughs> when we put on the full armor of God, this is how God sees us. In the spirit. Mighty warriors. Ready for battle. And it starts with knowing Jesus Christ is our Savior. And building upon that. And getting dressed every day and putting on that helmet of salvation that we know that we know that we know everything that Jesus gives us through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection.
So Holy Spirit, as we just prepare right now to go to the communion table. Father, as our worship team comes, as we get ready to just acknowledge who you are, <laughs> acknowledge that your body was broken for us, acknowledge that your blood was poured out for us, acknowledge that we are made whole in you. <coughs> Father, we just take a moment to say thank you. And Lord, I pray that as we as we take communion tonight and then we just leave this place, God, that these words don't leave and stay here. Father, that they go with us. Father, that we take them to our heart, we take them to our mind, we take them to our remembrance. And we remember the address of Ephesians chapter 6. And we remember to put on the full armor of God. Each piece specifically has a purpose for us to walk victoriously with you. So God, tonight, thank you for quickening us to these important pieces that we need to put on every day. Father, thank you for choosing us as the army of the Lord. And Father, thank you that everyone in this place is welcome to your banquet table. Because you died once for all. So, Lord, we give you this time. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Sometimes I amaze myself for doing that, Chase. <laughs> Pastor Tina's ever going to take partake of communion here. Um, last few weeks, I've been posting something over here on this board. As the Spirit led me. Tonight, Ephesians 1 7, it says, In Him, meaning in Jesus, we have redemption. And that word redemption means deliverance is a price. And the price was through his blood that was shed. And the blessing, or one of the results of it, is the forgiveness of our sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And you know, God lavishes. He lavishes his grace on us. Even though we didn't deserve it, he just pours it out on us. When I said that word redemption, I want to read to you the meaning of that. It says, redemption has the meaning of deliverance with a price. The price paid by Christ was costly through his blood. Paul reveals in this book, Ephesians, that God's provision of redemption in Christ covers the full range of human needs. Our need for forgiveness, deliverance, <laughs> reconciliation, peace, love, new life, Wisdom, understanding, community, acceptance, order, security, hope, and victory in our conflict with Satan and all his forces. That's redemption price that Christ paid for us. I want you to think about that as you're partaking your communion tonight. We're going to come up and we're going to take our communion. We'll go ahead and partake of it up here. You can do that as families if you'd like. I think that's very important. But we come together as a body or as a family of Christ, right? Yeah. And go ahead and partake of it. We'll go through this first. We'll pray. Corinthians chapter 11 says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you're drinking, remember of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we partake of the elements, both the bread and the juice. Lord, we're reminded of your body, which you sacrificed for us. 
that your blood was poured out to wash us clean of our sins. We know that without the shedding of blood, there is no removal of those sins or redemption from them. But because you loved us and were obedient to your Father, you gave not only your blood, but your life to redeem us, to give us hope, to give us a future. So tonight, Father, as we partake, stir our hearts. Let us remember that we have a past, but we have a present. And with you, Jesus, we have a future. A future in turn to Him. We have the now to serve you, to love you. Father, tonight our prayer is that you hear our hearts. And if there's anything within us that is not pure or unclean, that you wash them away tonight. We do have that redemption in the name of Jesus. And that's our prayer. In his name we pray. Amen. If you'll go ahead. This we know, we 
you're inspired to do your will in a new and exciting way. That we not hold back. That we go forward boldly in the name of Jesus. That we share the hope and the love of Christ with the world around us. That we put our hands and our hearts and our minds to work for the kingdom of God. Father, expand those ten pegs. Stretch out your kingdom to call, include all people, all nations, for all time. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.